One elite team is out to save lives. There's no medical crews on scene yet. No ambulance is required. We've just been called to a road traffic accident and the reports are that one of the patients is not breathing. These are the men and women who work for the air ambulance. It's taking the hospital to the patient. Open your eyes because it's easier for us to assess you. Okay. Uh, you focus on me, you all right? Yeah, spot on. Require both carriageways closed now. With highly qualified doctors on board, air ambulances bring a hospital intensive care unit to the roadside. We have the skills to stay and play, not scoop and run. Yeah, at the end of the day, it could be our family lying there who needs help. Funded mostly by charitable donations, air ambulances respond to over 14,000 call-outs a year. Without the public raising money for us, we simply couldn't operate. There you go. It's really, really important to be a team when you're out there. And working with some absolutely brilliant guys. No mind that bollocks, get the kettle on. You do need the banter because you do see some things. Best bit of the day. I absolutely love my job. <laughs> Let's have a good day. The Thames Valley and Chiltern Air Ambulance flies 900 missions a year from its base in Oxfordshire. Two pilots, 16 paramedics and 11 doctors work in shifts. And that is dinner. Paramedic Neil Plant is on cooking duty. Voila! Yeah, Neil's uh, a real sort of the earth paramedic, you know, and he's been there for so many years and done the job for so many years. He's really unflappable. It doesn't matter how big the job is, he'll back you up to the hilt. I'm going to serve up. You hungry? Yes. Dinner served. Thank you. We work together in a very small and very pressurised environment. It's natural that as a small team we become very, very close. And every day when you wake up, actually, you think it doesn't matter who's on the team because there'll be a great bunch of people. Hello, Benson. A roofer has had a serious fall at a village southwest of Oxford. Helimed 2 4 is deployed. Dr. Syed Masood is a consultant at Oxford's John Radcliffe Hospital and a veteran of 15 years as an air ambulance doctor. I became a doctor because partly I wasn't sure what to do uh, when you're doing your A-levels and you're doing three sciences and my mum suggested that medicine wouldn't be a bad option. But it was when I was working as a porter waiting for my A-level results to get into med school that I got into a lift one day and these guys came on with their orange suits and their helicopter badges and everything else and I thought I've got to do that for the rest of my life. So just lift and turn and hover taxi out to the right. All good in the green. The information that we had received for this incident, that it was a gentleman who had fallen from a roof approximately 20 feet and had a, a potentially nasty lower limb fracture and a possible head injury as well. So if this guy has got a significant head injury, then we will go for an RSI. So if he goes for an RSI, yep. uh, you become right-hand person, I'll take the head end, yep. we'll take the adult bag, we'll take the ultrasound, we'll take the drugs bag. Yeah, so three bags all together, yeah. Yeah, that yeah, sounds good. RSI is the technical term for basically anaesthesia on the roadside. Once that patient has been anaesthetised, controlling their breathing allows us to potentially decrease the damage that may have taken place via a head injury. This is one of the most dangerous procedures you can do to a patient. You're literally stopping them breathing and taking that over. Someone 
running down. Okay, there's someone in a field right below us <coughs> here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah spotted, yeah. Yeah, okay. We'll come from this far around over the field and just land in the corner of the field where he is there. Land in lights and straights. Yeah, good. Come on, secure in the back. Yeah, all secure in the back. There we go. Okay. Okay. When we arrive on scene, we try and gain as much information as we can from whether it's witnesses, whether it's other emergency services, and try to take in the scene itself to gain as much uh, intelligence of what's actually happened. The patient's colleagues fill the crew in. Uh, did he hit his head at all or anything? No, like he didn't seem to. He Not just at all. Down on his feet, I think that's what okay, lovely. So just an angry movie that we Looks know. like at the moment he's complaining of his back as well. Right, okay. He's had a bad back, but it's not visual, right. hasn't uh, it? How old is he? Yeah. Was it concrete he landed on? Well, a driveway. Driveway, yeah. okay. Well, it was a quiet little village until we turned up. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so how high up is he? Yeah. Um, right up, mate, when he... Yeah, right, right, right up top. Right up top. Right. Hello, guys. It looks like it's just isolated right lower leg ankle injury. It's an open fracture. Yeah. Um, no other pain, no other discomfort. Okay. And the gentleman's name? Uh, Rich. Yeah. Rich. Yeah. Rich. Yeah. Hello, sir. All right. My name's Sid. I'm one of the doctors on the air ambulance. Pleased yeah. to meet you. Sorry that you've had a bit of an accident there. We're going to get you sorted. We're going to take you to it's the John right. Radcliffe. My back's in agony because... I've suffered from my back and I've been laid okay. here for a quarter. I think we'll be very safe. Yeah. And because you have had a fall, mm -hmm. we're going to put you in a bit of a collar yeah, yeah, to make that. sure yeah, yeah. that your back and your neck is yeah, protected. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Ultimately, if someone's sitting there or lying there talking to you and they're sort of coherent and they know what day of the week it is, then yeah, that would give us a good indication that they probably haven't got a severe head injury. Do you mind if I have a look at your legs, sir? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's going to need ketamine yeah. uh, and some sedation, yeah, OK. Richard had a significant lower limb fracture or a broken bone which was also open, meaning that it had got through skin. If the fracture is not dealt with at that time, then there's always a risk that he may lose that limb due to nerve or blood vessel damage. What I'm going to do, Richard, yeah. um, I'm going to be honest with you, legs... Yeah, broken, you know, I know that. that. Yeah, I saw that. It's, it's not in a good view at the moment. Yeah. So they're really important that we put it back into place. Not Guys, just to let there. you know the plan, if you're happy, yeah, um, you we're going to have to put that back you, into position. We're going to sedate him with yeah. ketamine and morphine and midazolam. As soon as he's sedated, we'll put the leg back as it was. So, Richard, I'm going to give you some powerful drugs. Just relax. I want you to think about a holiday. When was your last holiday, sir? Last May. Last May. Where did you go? Lake District. Lake District. Good views? Yeah, yeah. Right, I want you to think about those views, OK? Got grandchildren? Oh, yeah. Sure. I was going to say think about them, but most people get more stressed, <laughs> don't they? So we'll give that a miss. How are you doing, Richard? <laughs> yeah, it is a conscious sedation, so he's still with it. So he may still moan, but he's had a good amount of pain relief as well. To manipulate the limb as quickly as possible, as safely as possible, and with the patient heavily sedated requires advanced techniques and advanced drugs. And that's where the air ambulance with the paramedic and physician partnership makes the difference. Valuable time will be lost if we leave the limb as it is and allow it to go to the hospital. It may be an hour or so before that is done in the hospital with every preparation. So let's get on and do this bit. Well Can you give him the rest of the morphine as well, please, mate? And just have another chat with him, see how we're doing. Where is Richard, he now? you're with us, mate. It's not nice hearing people moan and scream, but if you know you've given them pain relief, you've managed their pain to the best of your ability, um, then you just have to sort of blank it out a little bit and just do what you need to do. Mm -hmm. OK, just keep an eye on him, guys. Yeah, yeah. Uh -oh. Well done, Richard. Oh, oh, steady, well done, You're going to have to press. You're going to have to press. Well done, Rich. Good man. Okay, well done. Oh, it's not oh, good. No, no. That's it, that's it. Keep going. Keep going, mate. That's it, good. Right, ready? So, go on. Go for it now. A vacuum splint stabilises the fracture for the journey to the hospital and gives compression, which reduces bleeding. 
Keep going. Keep going. It needs a little bit more. I can still feel it. It's quite, yeah, absolute rock solid. And just walk across. And down. That's brilliant. You're doing really well. We're just going to get you on to the helicopter next. How's the pain, sir? You all right? Superb. That's fantastic. That's a good word for me as well. Richard's injury will now need to be treated by both orthopaedic and plastic surgeons. What we did on scene would make sure that their job is easier and the prognosis for Richard is better because we corrected some of the significant injury uh, on scene in the field itself. After a seven minute flight, Richard is delivered into the care of the major trauma centre at the John Radcliffe Hospital. This is Richard. He's a 58 year old gentleman. He's had a fall approximately 20 to 30 feet on a building yard onto concrete. His GCS has been 15 throughout. He's been moving all limbs except his right leg due to the actual injury itself. He has got a very nasty open fracture of the right tib fib. In order to immobilise and manipulate the actual limb itself, he's had ketamine, 70 milligrams, morphine, 10 milligrams, a dancitron, 4 milligrams, and midazolam, 4 milligrams. His leg and his foot was at a 30 degree angle initially. We've straightened it, but we've unable to put the bone actually itself back into the skin itself. So we all need that sorting out ASAP. I like to think it's kind of the elite of medicine. We do some of the most incredible stuff on the roadside that majority of doctors wouldn't think of doing. Although at times in my medical career I thought, am I doing the right thing? When I found pre-hospital care, I knew that that was the job for me. The Great North Air Ambulance operates from bases in Teesside and Cumbria. Its crews fly around a thousand missions every year, and between call-outs, it's their responsibility to clean the base. I started doing pre-hospital care because of the glamour and the glory it brought. I think the pilot's broken the hose. Always marvels how you handle a hose. Watching, as usual. I like to keep things clean and tidy, but the pilots and doctors always have a whinge when there's some dirty work to be done. I don't mind. It's like washing a big car. We're trained to look after people, so a good day for us is actually going out and working and doing a job. We don't want anybody to be injured. We don't want anybody to be really hurt, but we want to be there when it happens. control desk, paramedic Andy Mawson is concerned by a report of an asthmatic with breathing problems. Given the fact that uh, inhalers are working, I think we would have to certainly deploy and assess. Helimus 5 eight on that way. Thanks, man. Bye, bye. The patient is on a Lake District mountain, out of reach of a road ambulance. Job. Um, I'm a consultant anaesthetist at the Royal Victoria Infirmary in Newcastle and I predominantly work in trauma and one day a week I work with a Great North Air Ambulance. Whether you're going to be up a mountain, in a factory, in a farmyard, in somebody's home, you never actually know what's going to be coming next. Asthma can be life-threatening, so when a call comes in, uh, it's important that we get there really quickly for a patient, particularly if they're on a hill where nobody else can get to them. Asthma is estimated to kill about 1,200 people a year. 
the doctor and paramedic team on the helicopter can bring a different set of drugs, um, magnesium for example, which are a doctor only drug, um, without us on the helicopter, that patient would have to wait until they get to hospital before they get that. Mountain Rescue has also been called out. Their skills may be needed to help evacuate the patient to the helicopter. Pilot Phil struggles to find a safe landing spot. Right, mate, you're looking, basically, that field in the 12 o'clock with all the sheep, you're looking, that's all area there, I think. Yes, with zero places to land. Casualties coming up on your left now. Look behind the tree here, aren't they? Quite steep, isn't it? Uh, is it possible to touch down and get Rachel out, or...? There's no way to get over, because how are we going to get over that wall? That's the other issue. Yep. Yeah. There's no way to land around no here. land at all now. Well, then, well, we're going to have to go down at bottom, I'm afraid. It's going to be a canny hike. The only safe place to land is nearly a mile from the patient and over 300 feet lower. Right, doors open. Roger. First response bag, which is the red rucksack, has got um, just about everything you would need to respond initially, and that weighs about 35 pounds. So quite a weight. So perfect for Stu to be carrying up a hill, not me. Do you need a hand? Ah! This might be great! We essentially need to improvise and adapt to overcome the challenges because every environment is different. If that means trying to hitch a lift with a farmer to expedite us getting to the patient, then whatever is required within limits, obviously. Right, come yeah. on then. Do you want to say if I can get in, I'll bring the bag up. If you get in there with the bag, I'll get in the front. <laughs> is this going to be safe? Yeah. Do you mind? Sorry, what's your name? Mary. Mary. Hello, I'm Rich. I'm one of the doctors. Right, what's the best way to get on here? Uh, Christ. Right. <laughs> I can't believe we're doing this. <laughs> You'll be all right with me on the back of this. I don't mean on the front. You might have to, you might have to walk. I'll run. <laughs> so is there anybody there with them? No. Just their own party. Thank you for this. Don't tip where I am. Thank you, Mary. That was a genius stroke of an idea by me, I think. It saved you for carrying that. Hi. It's an amazing view. Who wouldn't want to work here? Rachel's enthusiastic about everything. Um, I am too, but when you're carrying a really heavy bag up a mountain, it doesn't show quite so well. <sighs> Stu, are you all right with the bag? Yeah, yeah. Oh, there they are. <laughs> it's taken Rachel and Stu 20 minutes to get from the helicopter to the patient. She's been out walking as part of her Duke of Edinburgh award. Hello there. Hello, I'm Rachel Hawes. I'm one of the doctors from the air ambulance. What's your name? Ellie. Say, Ellie. Ellie. What happened, Ellie? My chest went tight. It went tight. And has that settled now or still feels tight? OK. <laughs> And have you, are you otherwise well at the moment? Have you had a cough or a cold or a chest infection? No. Nothing like that? Any pain in your chest? Yeah, I've got pain. Where's your pain? Here in my back. And what does it feel like? Stabbing. Like a stabbing pain. When we got to Ellie, um, she was obviously suffering from shortness of breath. Uh, she'd been using her inhalers, but they weren't working. And it's quite easy at that point to become very short of breath and start to panic about it. And if you panic, you become more short of breath. Obviously, an inhaler is a medication that you need to get into your lungs. If you're breathing backwards and forwards too quick, that medication's not getting there. Great. That's that sounds great. So, just try and relax. Your chest sounds lovely and clear. It sounds like it's gone back to normal. OK, your oxygen levels are normal, so that's great. 
what we'll do is just check your blood pressure and things. Sorry. Try and yeah. relax, because you're doing fine, you know. Part of our role is not just to address the medical side of things, but also to try and reassure the patient. What would be great for me is if you could just try and slow your breathing down in slow breaths. Lovely. That's brilliant. Let us go ahead. Ellie is out of danger, but she needs a checkup at hospital and a road ambulance to get her there. And if you've got to arrange for them to get a road vehicle, if we've got one just down to the bottom, um, down in Glenridding, over. Yeah, received understood. Thanks, Stu. For Ellie, we set up a nebulizer, which is the same as the blue inhaler that she carries, um, same drug, but it's forced through oxygen. Uh, which turns it into an aerosol and she can breathe that in as well as breathing in oxygen to try and uh, get the medication into her lungs. But it wasn't as serious as it could have been, but it, it's important for us to go. Unless you're there, you don't know how bad the asthma is and we would much rather go and it be not as serious than actually risk somebody's life, particularly on the hills. Patterdale Mountain Rescue will carry Ellie down the hill to the ambulance. Well, get well soon. I'm sure you'll be fine. And uh, we'll see you. So you enjoy the rest of your holiday. Take care, OK, Ali? We'll see you later. No, I'm thinking Stu picked it up, but uh, no, I'll carry it. No problem. I'm just thinking that's got a poo now all over the back, so I'm going to be covered. I think that was a sly manoeuvre off Stu to get me to carry the bag going downhill when it was covered in GP rather than himself. But never mind, it's teamwork at the end of the day. It's all right for you, Rachel. I've got to carry this coat. <laughs> I've got this whole coat to carry. <laughs> I should point out that I volunteered to carry the bag down. But Rachel, being Rachel, has said that she will. And then she'll complain about it for the rest of the day. That's not true at all. <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> Two hundred miles south in Oxfordshire. Paramedic Lisa Brown is on standby for a call out. Okay, you can get a can opener. Said, anyone? No. Oh, Bailey, what are we going to do? You're being so good. Just use the scalpel. <coughs> Just wait, I'm trying. Oh, we did it. Good boy, so wait. Mmm, yummy. She is just as so passionate about her work and she is interested in anybody, whether two-legged or four-legged. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, sweetness. Okay, thanks, bye. Carl versus pedestrian, 16-year-old. Helimed 2-4 with Dr Syed and paramedic Lisa on board is heading to Aylesbury. The initial call reported a 16-year-old pedestrian hit by a car. There's uh, a decrease on the scene and there's some confusion over this job. Um, the mother's saying the patient has been hit by a car and now has a head injury. And so I'm saying he's fitted and then fallen into the road. Yeah, that's all received. Uh, could you give me an age of the patient, please? Over. We're not entirely sure. We think he's um, around 17, 18, but we can't get much information from the scene of OK, we're uh, just coming overhead now, Saeed. Yeah, many thanks, Sarah. What you're told initially when you get the job may not be actually what happened when you get there. It's like a jigsaw puzzle, really. There's two crews on the scene. Yeah, yeah got them. The incident's in an area so built up, pilot Tim can't land nearby. It's not the greatest 
spot, is it really? But um, looking like it's uh, a fair distance away. I think that's our best option. I'll we figure it out. Just have to show me again where I'm going. Yeah, you're going to go down this path. Yep. Uh, you'll get to a bridge. I know that. When you get to the bridge, turn uh, turn right. Oh, turn right, not left. Thank you. Okay, nice. Where can I get you closer? No, no, this is fine. He said turn left, didn't he? Turn, no, turn right, I agree. It's not coming that way. Yeah, straight to Can you just a favour? We're a little bit lost. Can you track our radio and tell us where you think we need to go? Sorry, honey. Yeah, I think it's yeah, up there, it's yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi guys. Hi. Hello mate, you're right. Hello. What have we got? Hello, Hello sweetheart. This is um, How are you doing? Jake. Yeah, Jake, 17 year old chap. Yeah. Not actually sure what's happened to him. He was going yeah. I'll tell you what, let's get him in yeah. the back yeah. and then. Uh... Yeah. We get you inside, sweetheart, we get your mum in, okay? Right. So Jake was found cracked where he was lying. Yeah. Um, there was a witness oh. who saw him having a seizure oh. lasting about a minute. And then he was quite agitated when he came round. Quite a, a deep laceration to his head with grey oh. marks down here. Can I go back to the beginning again? Um, there was a history of maybe an RTC or not. We don't know. So we don't know, don't know anything previous to this event? Yeah. The, lady wasn't with there, any... the lady out there did see him having a seizure, so yeah. she'd be surprised if the car was involved. Yeah, but I was Jake, my friend, what? can you remember? He thought he heard a phone. I had a cigarette. Okay. Yeah. And then okay. I it out um, and I saw that yeah. one. Where's the okay. head injury? Did you hear that? No. Okay, so Jake's had a cigarette. Um, obviously, sometimes cigarettes can make you feel a little bit dizzy. Jake has confirmed that it did make him feel dizzy, which was unusual to him. So you can remember putting a cigarette out? Yeah, and I went to walk back to the house. So now you know okay. the house that I was at. Yeah. Don't get angry. All oh, right, not right. Yeah. Okay. Mum, best not to discuss that here at the moment. Yeah. Can I just yeah. listen yeah. to Jake? Sorry, there's right. multiple conversations going on. So just carry on, Jake. Speak to Lisa and just tell me what happened, um, what, how much you remember. So you remember uh, putting the cigarette and then out? I went to walk back okay. to the house. And then, and um, then what? Then I woke up. Okay, and that's when you woke up panicking with everybody around yeah. you. Jake didn't want to say much about the fact that he had been smoking because he was worried about what his parents um, might say about that. That did add to the initial confusion of how he'd been injured because obviously, you know, if you don't have the full story and the full facts, you know, the, the story can be uh, slightly muddled. So the chances are then something's happened and you've possibly either passed out or you've had a, some episode of some kind, OK? But obviously what we're trying to establish is that there was nothing else involved. The cigarette could be a factor in Jake's collapse, but there's little solid information to help Syed and Lisa. Their priority becomes checking him for injuries. Right, keep your head nice and still for me, darling. I'm just having a look around your right, your head, OK, my darling? OK, so this is what he's got in his head. It's a nice little yeah, lack, yeah, yeah. but otherwise minimal bleed at the moment. OK, that's good. Quickly, I'm just going to have a quick feel down your legs. Any pain or tenderness when I'm pressing down there? No. no. Can you raise this one up into the air for us? That's brilliant. Any pain and tenders when you're doing that at all? No. And just raise it, raise up a bit more for me. If a car was involved in the incident, Jake could have sustained internal injuries from the impact. Okay. Jake, what we're going to do, mate? We're just going to have a quick ultrasound scan of your tummy. Okay. Okay. All right. It's not going to hurt. The only problem with it is a bit of cold gel on the side. Okay. Okay. The ultrasound machine is carried by the air ambulance, and used to check for internal injuries. We're just checking out your liver, your kidneys. Just making sure there's no other injuries. I know you did say that you initially had a bit of tummy ache, but like you said, it was probably just a bit of nervousness. And... I'm not pregnant, I can tell you that. <laughs> Got news for you, Jake, I'm afraid. No, I'm only joking. No, you're definitely not pregnant, mate. It's advanced pre-hospital care, enhanced care, that is reflecting what people do in hospital that we can do right at that point of injury at the roadside. That's fantastic. OK, so fast scan is negative. No other obvious injuries at all, no. apart from the head injury. So, head so head I think we'll get you to the local hospital. I'm afraid you've done yourself out of a helicopter ride today. Oh, Maybe next time round.
Okay, but I think what we do need to worry about is just what actually happened. Whether you had this, the word we use is seizure, whether you know this was a collapse or something else. Okay, so we're going to have yeah. to do a full check on you, which the local hospital will be able to do very, very well. Okay, okay. you may need a scan of your head. That they, again, they'll be able to do that as well. Okay. okay. Um, I'm not sure if this will happen again if I have a cigarette. I would say to you, never touch those nasty things again. Mm -hmm. Good man. Okay, we're going to leave you in the capable hands of the paramedics. Take care, guys. Bye. All right, you'll be all right. You'll be fine. No all right, worries, take care. He's absolutely fine. The walk back is always a weary one. I find. It is. I was just thinking that. Let me take that. Huh? Well, it's all right. You can take that. <laughs> I put one on the front and I stick one on my head, just like they carry buckets of water on your head. Hello. 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 It's a checklist complete. Copy, thank you. In Cumbria. Dr. Rachel Hawes and her colleagues are deployed to an incident involving a child injured at a school sports day. We're going to a school at Cartmel. Okay, be that way. For a 12 year old child with a back injury. Okay. There is supposed to be a doctor on scene um, who is querying a spinal injury. Charlie Lima, Charlie Lima, Helimed 58. Helimed 58, stand down, stand down, and crew dealing of it. Yeah, Roger, receive, stand down. It's just uh, pass that to our uh, desk as well, Owen. How were you on to school sports day, Rachel? That was amazing! <laughs> Within minutes, there's a call from base about another job. It's across the Pennines, near Durham. When we tasked to uh, what came in initially as a a cyclist uh, that had been involved in a collision with a car, then straight away we know that the, uh, there's potential for quite serious injuries there. The only thing we've been informed is that he's got an open leg uh, wound um, and a likely um, open fracture. Arriving by air definitely gives you a, an overview of the whole scene. You can see what direction cars may have been travelling, what kind of speed might have been involved. So definitely arriving from air gives us a good picture of uh, potentially what we may be finding injury-wise when we get to the casualty. Going over the small domestic type on wires as we speak, committed to landing now inside the field itself. Okay. Still good on the left. We're down at 20 past. Okay, doors open now. Hello. Can I hand you some stuff over? Would you give us a hand? Right, is this a safe place to climb? Would you mind uh, giving us a hand one second? Because this fence is not that sturdy. Well, well, is that all right? That's it. We've got that. Yeah. Because uh, I don't want it to go flying when I'm on it, that'll be the next thing. Exactly. The patient, Emma, was out cycling with her partner, Ray, when the collision happened. Where's your pain? Is it just in your, just in your leg? Have you got pain anywhere else? No, I'm just going to check you over. Do you remember what happened, Emma? Eh? Right, any pain here? Any pain here? Is that OK? No pain round there? Do you know where you are, Emma? Do you know where you are? Yeah, 
you know what day it is today, Emma? Although Emma's got a fractured thigh bone, that's not Rachel's immediate concern. We identified on reviewing the car that there was a bullseye on the windscreen, which would suggest that she's hit the windscreen with significant force, and I was concerned she might have a significant head injury. There were some scuffs and dents on her helmet, which would obviously suggest that um, her helmet's taken some of the force, which is great because it's protected her. And she had no neurological symptoms or signs, which reassured me that she didn't have a significant underlying brain injury. <coughs> Emma, you're OK. You're doing really well. You've broken your leg there, which I'm sure you realise. What we're just going to do is get you some more painkillers. We'll pop a little splint on that with some dressing, get you some antibiotics, OK? All right. I think it's not, yeah. I've got a bandage of tape for that. We'll just switch it at a moment We've given you lots of morphine, so that'll help with the pain. So you just try and relax. As an anaesthetist, it's really satisfying to be able to bring um, extra skills to that situation to provide um, stronger painkillers um, to allow us to do procedures that the patient needs to have done very early on um, in order to improve the long-term outcome from their injuries. Rachel can't rule out internal injuries in Emma's pelvis. A GP who happened to be passing assists with fitting a pelvic sling a precaution to stabilise the area. Only then can the team deal with the broken thigh bone. To treat Emma's uh, fractured leg, we applied a traction splint. The purpose of a traction splint is to pull the bones apart. The fractures are very painful when the bones rub together. Also promotes a lot of bleeding. And if we can uh, put some traction on it, pull them apart, stops the bleeding and also reduces the pain. Are you in a position to pull it? Yeah. Are you happy? Deep breath, deep breath, deep deep breath. Deep breath. Come on. Right. Ah! Emma, breathe in, breathe in. Not before I want it it'll feel loads better. Is that as tight as it going? Come on, is that in right? Yeah. Does that look as if it's pulled straight? Yeah. Right, Emma, that's the worst bit done. No, you just relax. It was helpful having Emma's partner on scene because uh, he can keep reassuring her, telling Emma everything is going to be fine. We have a 25-year-old female cyclist who has been hit from the side by a car. She has a left open femur fracture. She's had morphine and ketamine for pain control and uh, we're approximately 10 minutes into the RVI order. Emma, you're here. Well done. You're in. Sorted. <laughs> Emma, don't worry, you're going to be fine. Have you been in a helicopter before? Yeah, I didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, today's your lucky day. Okay, left, way right. We've got wind farm off to the left. And the NSB coming on now. It's really important to give good pain control and put splints on and all those things, but sometimes what they need is just um, a hand to hold and a comfort in the word. It's only an eight minute flight to the Royal Victoria Infirmary in Newcastle. Right, Emma, you've done ever so well, OK, we're nearly there. Is it just your leg that's hurting still now? In the back of your head, this board isn't the most comfy. Hey? He's coming in the car later. This is Emma. She's 25. Uh, just after 6 o'clock today, she was involved in an RTC. She was riding a bicycle, knocked off at low speed. Low speed okay. She was initially a bit drowsy and confused. Since we've got there, she's been GCS 14. She's now much more orientated. She's got an isolated femoral fracture, which is open. open. She's had Kendrick splint put on and the fracture reduced. She's had some antibiotics, analgesia. She's had 20 morphine, 30 ketamine and some Entenox. Emma will be scanned to rule out internal injuries and have surgery on her leg. How 
to me she'll be all right. She just she seems to just have an isolated femoral fracture, which, um, considering the mechanism, you know, could have been a lot worse. So, but she was wearing a helmet, so it would suggest that she hasn't taken a significant impact to her head. She's got hasn't got any wounds, so hopefully she'll be all right. It's great when you come home at the end of a hard day and you, you think, yeah, we've saved somebody's life there or you've made an intervention that's made a massive difference to the patient, especially when you come to work not knowing what's going to happen for that day and you get home and you think, yeah, yeah I did that today. I absolutely love my job. I get the opportunity to work with a great team of people. I enjoy the thrill of not knowing what's going to come next. But I also enjoy the satisfaction that you get knowing that you make people feel a lot better at the end of the day. And if I couldn't do that anymore, I really don't know what I would do. I feel when I'm doing pre-hospital care that I'm really making a difference to that patient at that point. It is one of the most positive things of medicine that I can do. My cast is a good fit, it feels better. Uh, not so keen on the part, but that's my wife apparently. <laughs> He's a fighter. He, he'll bounce back and he'll be fine. He's determined, I think the world is. That's what he started off with, a mess like that. And then this is the finished product. Two plates, one on each bone. Everybody's had a count of it and we think there's 19 screws, but it's a work of art, put it that way. What we look for in people who work within their ambulance is um, that they have the ability to work as a team. They need to be able to work under extreme pressure. But I think the most important thing is, is not forgetting their compassion towards the patients that they're treating. The absolute reason that we're there is to make life better for that patient. Getting off the bus, walked out in front of the car. Well done. Ah! Well done. You must be real hardcore, Margaret. You can take the pain. Not like most men, though, eh? <laughs> <laughs> this bike has come off, and he's managed to plough himself down through a hedge and into, like, a tunnel of brambles and trees. And he's really, really stuck. 